All right. Thanks, guys, for coming to uh, Living and Eating Well's uh, second webinar series. We're super excited to have you guys uh, join us. Maybe you're joining for the second time, or maybe this is your first time. Uh, this is Stacey Kennedy, and we are going to be talking about all you should know about cooking a Mediterranean diet today. Um, and just uh, a reminder, if you guys go on our website, newenglandcancerspecialist.com, you can go under resources, The new, or there's a nutrition tab, and all the workshops are on the website, and you can, um, you can sign up for one workshop at a time, or you can actually sign up for all the workshops. I think we're going until April um, or May. So check it out if you guys haven't already, and I will kick it off to Stacey. Great, thank you so much, Leah. Uh, thanks for having me back, everyone. It's so good to be here. Feel free as we go to put questions um, into the Q and A, um, and then if there are like topics you want more discussion about at the end, because we'll leave plenty of time, you could put those in the chat. And if you forgot what I just said, just write it wherever it doesn't really matter. Um, and you know, you may have other nutrition questions unrelated to Mediterranean diet, that's fine too. So our focus today, I'm gonna to share my screen, is a really popular and delicious topic of the Mediterranean diet. Um, and you've probably heard all about the Mediterranean diet just in terms of healthy eating and healthy living. And there's a lot of uh, information that is out and a lot of new information coming out specifically related to cancer survivorship and cancer prevention around the Mediterranean diet. So I'm a registered licensed dietitian, board certified specialist in oncology nutrition, um, and I love questions and discussion. So whether it's like practical focused about cooking um, or any of the information, you know, please don't hesitate um, to ask. So this is kind of the content that I wanna to cover today. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Mediterranean diet, like what is it, why is there so much attention about it now, what are some of the benefits for health and wellness, what about cancer specifically, what exists in terms of research and understanding of how and why this style of eating might be beneficial um, for someone who's been diagnosed with cancer or someone looking to prevent cancer, what are some of the specific foods, like what is a Mediterranean diet mean. Um, we could certainly all travel the world and enjoy some local cuisine, but how do we kind of implement that, you know, here at home and then get into some practical ideas. So some meal ideas, some recipe ideas that I will show you and then have lots of time for Q&A. So in terms of the history of the Mediterranean diet, you know, it's really interesting. There is a lot of um, content out there related to sort of you know, why, why this came about. So if we just, you know, I'm not a history teacher, I'll preface with that. Um, but if we kind of just, you know, really start to think about the origins of, of eating, we can really kind of understand how the Mediterranean diet still has such a strong role today. So it really encompasses a large area. We probably, when I say Mediterranean diet, we probably have a specific country or like region in mind, but the Mediterranean region is big. Um, even though the Mediterranean Sea is not as big as like, you know, the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean, it really covers a lot of civilizations that have been in existence for thousands of years. So it really, in terms of this kind of diet or lifestyle relates to these like rich traditions um, that have to do not only with the type of food, Right, like when we think of diet, we think of like, you're on a diet, you know, I'm on a low carb diet, I'm on a keto diet, I'm on a whatever kind of diet. And it really revolves around like what you're eating. The Mediterranean diet, so diet's not really the best word, it's like a lifestyle, kind of goes way beyond that. So it also has a lot to do with the style of cooking. So not just the ingredients, but actually how that food is prepared. And then even further, into the rituals around mealtime and eating. So it isn't just about eating like fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds. It's how are they prepared and like what is your process around eating? So we will have an entire workshop at some point um, in our calendar dedicated to this idea of mindful eating, but that's a really big piece that's like inherent 
to the Mediterranean diet. So when we think of this lifestyle, we're combining health and taste and having it be visually pleasing. So it goes way beyond like what you're just gonna read in a book. It's really experiential. So the Mediterranean diet is deeply rooted in what is known as like the cradle of civilization. So kind of where um, sort of modern-ish, you know, man really lived and how they lived and how they ate. So, you know, you'll think of Greece and Italy are probably the two places that come to mind, but really that entire Mediterranean region, we can pull from and learn and implement that into the style of eating. So it's a fusion of culture, of custom and food. So it's not just about food. And this is really applicable to, particularly to people going through cancer treatment where that treatment might influence your appetite, your taste buds. So there's a lot to be learned here or for people who are looking to manage their weight and metabolism, it's really about more than just what we're eating. So I'll like take a quick pause because I feel like that's like different than what you expect me to talk about. And I don't know if I did a good job explaining it. So does that make sense to people? Like, are we on board? Like we're gonna talk about foods, but like, I want you to try to immerse yourself in the culture. So like, for example, like if you go visit like Europe or you go to like say Italy or Greece, you know, if you go to like downtown Boston or New York city, like for sure you see people like walking down the street, like stuffing food in their face because they have like a five minute lunch break. Like you would not really see that if you go overseas to this area, right? People are sitting down, they're probably sitting down with their family, you know, think of like siesta, you go home in the middle of the day, you eat this like leisurely meal, you might eat this like long dinner, or like in a car, um, you know, like a lot of cars that are made overseas, you know, meant for Europeans, don't necessarily have cup holders, you shouldn't be eating and drinking when you're driving or distracted. We, um, there's an uh, oncologist, they're both oncologists, like a couple that we used to live near, and one is from France. And like their kids like literally don't eat snacks. Like that's just not a thing. You sit down, you have meals as a family three times a day. So I'm not saying we can all morph our life into that. It would be great. But like, we wanna try to infuse some of those other aspects that are unrelated to what we're eating and really think about that, like that culture and that experience. So does that sort of make sense to everybody? Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's kind of part of the exciting part about this. You're not like on a diet. You're like, you know, almost like you're like studying abroad, you know, from the comfort of your own home. <laughs> okay. So what are the foods, right? So obviously we're going to talk about foods. Um, so we'll get more specific, but when we think of the Mediterranean diet, um, so part of the health benefits come from this cultural piece. And then part of it comes from the actual food. So it's really rooted in a lot of plant-based food. So tons of vegetables, fruits, and fresh herbs. So we had the, um, it was amazing. We actually got to take a trip this summer, our family, and go to Italy. And we stayed in this small town on the coast. And there was literally, it was like a lot of stairs, tons of stairs. Like, this is why you don't need a gym. Like, you just walk up these stairs to get to your place. And there was like, basil and oregano like growing out of the stairs like not somebody planted it it was like in there and like finding its way out so <laughs> fresh herbs are everywhere um and that's something you can think about at home even like a small you know herb box like in your window you don't need like a whole big garden um but fresh herbs are a big part of this right remember it's like it's not just the actual food and the fact that they have, you know, plant-based compounds that are antibacterial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory. They also bring a lot of that flavor and that visual appeal. Then we have the healthy fats. Um, so we have things like olive oil, nuts and seeds as examples. And then whole grains would be another category that's a big part of the Mediterranean diet. So Mediterranean diet, is not like a low carb diet. These whole grains, they call them cereals, but I, I changed it to whole grains because if I say cereal, you think like, you know, I don't know, Frosted Flakes or something like that. <laughs> like, 
Seed oils meaning like whole, what we would call whole grain. So like rice and like quinoas and millet and all that kind of stuff. And then fish and uh, shellfish or seafood and eggs. These are some protein foods um, that are prevalent. And then some dairy and some meat. It's just more limited than the typical American diet. And a lot of it is more like sheep or goat milk based. So things like Parmesan or um, Romano cheese or goat cheese, feta, these are kind of more of the types of meats and cheese that you'll find. So what are the benefits of all these delicious and vibrant foods and this whole lifestyle? So remember, it's like a lifestyle. So in terms of research, there's been quite a bit of study that has gone on in the last you know, few decades showing overall a reduced overall mortality from people who are following a Mediterranean diet. Specifically, there's a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. It's where we see a lot of the benefits. So that means like strokes and cholesterol levels, blood pressure, these are lower. People have a lower risk from following a Mediterranean diet. A lower BMI, so uh, easier time with weight management, also reduced blood sugar, and just reduced overall inflammation markers in the body reduced risk of type two diabetes specifically. And then there are anti-aging, so like longevity and brain health benefits. It's like the whole package, <laughs> sounds really great. Um, and so again, it's like, yes, these foods help, but we're also um, kind of having this like synergistic uh, lifestyle approach where we prioritize eating and cooking and family and mealtime. So, I mean, even if you live alone, you might have a pet, you know, you might be like just taking that time for that self-care. So cooking can feel overwhelming and stressful, but it can also be very kind of zen and stress reducing if you really put that time into it. So if you look at a lot of the traditional recipes, they have very few ingredients that are like well-sourced, but it's the technique and the years of practice. Like if you've ever tried to make like homemade pasta, it's like three ingredients. But obviously it's not that easy in terms of like having it come out like somebody who's been doing it their whole life, right? So that kind of love that you're putting into the process is really just as important as having those simple um, ingredients. But so these are the benefits that have been um, seen from people following the Mediterranean diet. Now, in terms of cancer specifically, because that wasn't really like on that last slide. So the research looking at cancer is a little bit um, less prevalent, right? Like those are studies that are happening now. Um, there's a lot more data looking at things like diabetes reduction, weight management, metabolic disease, heart disease. Um, but those things relate to cancer risk as well. We know that there are at least uh, 12 or 13 cancers that are linked with an increased risk from carrying excess body weight, specifically in the midsection, right? So there's a lot of ways to connect what I showed you on the last slide to um, cancer prevention, but there are some specific studies that are happening as well. And so um, specifically like, Overall, a Mediterranean diet has been shown to help reduce the incidence of cancer. So it is one of the many ways a person can help lower their risk of developing uh, cancer. For people who've already been diagnosed with cancer, there's some studies showing that a Mediterranean style diet may help reduce some of the symptoms and treatment related side effects. So that is something that can be really, really helpful. And honestly, I can think of a lot of ways that that might be possible. We don't know all of them in research, but just kind of thinking about the experience of someone going through treatment, right? Your appetite might be reduced. So like the quality of those foods is really important because you're not gonna be able to eat as much. Um, chemo can kind of affect almost like how a person like perceives taste and hunger. So taste can change, that appetite is a little bit different. So that like vibrancy, and the taste qualities and the sort of aesthetic aspect of the Mediterranean diet can certainly be helpful. Um, and maybe it's anti-inflammatory components, um, but those mechanisms, those are my thoughts. Those mechanisms all need to be kind of shown. 
Um, but, but people have reported reductions in symptoms from following a Mediterranean diet. There are some studies looking at prostate cancer. So there, there are a few studies showing a slower progression of prostate cancer from people following a Mediterranean diet. So that research, you know, we need more studies, but that's really encouraging. Um, and then in women with breast cancer, there have been some studies showing um, that at the time of diagnosis, if people were following a Mediterranean diet, uh, their prognosis might be more favorable. And so the point is that while a Mediterranean diet may help in terms of cancer prevention, there's all this research starting to come out looking at how it may promote survivorship and just overall health and wellness. So your heart health, brain health, and all of that. Um, but these were some of the studies that you know, have been published to date. So certainly happy to answer any questions. You know, more research needs to be done. I feel like like anything else with nutrition, it like starts with prostate cancer and breast cancer. And then we'll start to see more studies for other types of diagnoses too. Um, but these are some things that, that are out there now. Okay, so next I wanna go, actually, I kind of showed you that for a second, but I'm gonna ask you, so type this into the, into the chat. So based on what I've said so far, based on your understanding of the Mediterranean diet, start naming some like specific foods. So like, what are some actual foods um, that you think are part of the Mediterranean diet? So like, you can even be more, you can be super specific, like name a certain kind of food or like, we kind of talked about categories, but I want to start us to um, think about like, this all sounds great, Stacey, but like, what do I actually do? So, um, so now that you're convinced you want to eat the Mediterranean diet, what do you think are some foods that would be part of that? Okay, great. So salmon, avocados, definitely. What are some other things that come to mind? And then I'll show you some more examples. Almonds. Yeah, almonds, definitely. What about uh, beans? Yeah, beans would be part of it too. Yes, sunflower seeds. Yep, absolutely. Yep, fruits and veggies, olives. Yeah, good one, yes. Oh, um, your chat is disabled. Well, we can use the Q&A. I don't, it, it like. Oh yeah, use the Q&A, yep. I guess kind of they feel like the same thing to me. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, these are all excellent examples of foods. I'm going to show you a few more here. So here are some more. And again, like we've heard some of these. Um, I had olive oil on here. Olive oil is like actually like really important. Like in a Mediterranean diet, people are eating like not, you don't need like a whole lot, but like a for sure, like a tablespoon of olive oil, like a day. So whether you're dipping a whole grain bread into it, you're drizzling it over some pasta, you're using it as a salad dressing. Olive oil is a really important component. You put it, make like avocado toast. Um, when I cook salmon, I like to cook in the oven. Um, I don't add a lot because salmon already has healthy fats, but I put a little bit um, of olive oil on there as well. Um, but you know, if you're someone who's used to buying salad dressing, like most of us are, that's like an area where you can like reduce your sugar intake, save money and like have it be a little bit cleaner. You can mix olive oil with like a vinegar if you wanted, if you like vinegar and maybe like lemon, maybe some black pepper, maybe a pinch of salt and you have like an amazing dressing. Like if I mix that and put it over like chopped up like cucumber and tomato, like my kids will stand there and eat the entire bowl. But if I just chop up cucumber and I mean, I'm a nutritionist, so they'll probably eat it, but like they, they will eat way more if I add just that olive oil, um, really even just olive oil, salt and pepper. It can be that simple. Um, beans are definitely part of a Mediterranean diet. Lentils, because remember, it's the whole Mediterranean region. It's not just Greece and Italy. So if we think of other kind of more Middle Eastern types of uh, Mediterranean areas, you're going to see things like lentils um, and beans be part of that. This yellow bowl here, can anyone guess Guess what that is? It's all kind of a hard one, but feel free to take a guess. I'll give you a hint. If you're Southern, you might know the answer even more because it's more common in the US and the South. 
Yeah. Thank oh, Stephanie. Nice job. Yes. Grits or polenta, um, which is, tech, you know, usually what it's called, um, you know, in the Mediterranean region um, is, is definitely a part of the Mediterranean diet. And grits are really good, slow carb um, that you can complement with like eggs and like chives and, you know, really turn that into a nice savory like breakfast or um, dinner. There's also down here, this is like a wild rice. These are oats, you know, remembering that those uh, cereals or whole grains are really important components. Um, you know, here's an example of salmon, but remember seafood and shellfish. So like mussels and shrimp and clams, these are also important in a Mediterranean diet and give us a lot of immune supportive minerals. So shellfish and seafood are really rich in minerals like zinc, and like selenium, and these are key for immunity. We need selenium for metabolism. So the salmon is getting sardines are gonna kind of have like our like omega-3 healthy fat, they're gonna have protein, um, but we're gonna get some of these minerals from the other like shellfish as well. Um, green leafy vegetables, um, eggs. Eggs are part of a Mediterranean diet as well. So we know eggs are a really good source of protein and the yolks have uh, choline, which is key for brain health, as well as B12 and vitamin E. So like, you know, even thinking about like symptoms from treatment, right? So peripheral like neuropathy, like numbness and tingling in the hands and feet, we know vitamin B12 um, helps uh, in terms of that. Uh, avocado, all the nuts and seeds. So this time of year, right, we got pumpkin seeds. So when you're carving your pumpkin, rinse the like orange strings out and roast your pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds are really high in omega-3. They're really high in fiber and they have a lot of healthy fat. Uh, walnuts also have omega-3, but all the nuts and seeds have different minerals and have different nutrients and vitamins. So almonds have vitamin E, which is again, really key for like immunity and anti-inflammation and heart health. Um, and then, you know, each of the nuts, any nut or seed, sunflower seeds were mentioned, pine nuts, like pesto, right? Like basil. So think about using fresh or, or dried herbs, right? So start with dried herbs because you they're easier, um, but start to get like a fresh herb when you go to the store or grow a little bit at your home. Like oregano would go, would be really nice. Basil, um, parsley, thyme. So, and again, these are things you can put, like here's thyme in the picture with the salmon. You can just put like right on top of the fish when you cook it and that herb kind of adds the, the flavoring in. It's a good question, Stacy. Oh, I love this one. Yes, what gives? I love it. This is, yeah. So, <laughs> Um, okay, so there is a whole class of uh, vegetables that are called like nightshade vegetables. So things that kind of grow more under the ground. So, well, actually peppers don't, so that's not a good explanation. But anyway, they're called nightshade vegetables. So it'd be like um, peppers, uh, tomatoes, um, an eggplant, right? That's like a big one in terms of the Mediterranean diet. Um, so they're not inflammatory for, um, for everyone. Um, they really are, it is something that's kind of come out um, in response to like the um, autoimmune issues that we're kind of seeing. So foods are not really kind of like one thing, meaning, um, you know, we can all sort of agree, I guess, that like, you know, excessive amounts of sugar, fried foods, those are going to be more promoting of inflammation as like a habit, not like in, you know, one moment in time. But when it comes to certain foods, certain foods might be technically healthy, but may not really um, work for each and every body. So for example, if somebody has like IBS or a lot of gas and bloating, eating a lot of raw vegetables, even though they're healthy, might make their symptoms worse. So tomatoes, green peppers, and eggplant are no doubt healthy. There's, they are 100% healthy. And in the big picture, they are anti-inflammatory. They're a big part of the Mediterranean diet. There's so much research about cooked tomatoes reducing the risk of prostate cancer. Green peppers have vitamin C. 
These are healthy foods that for most people are beneficial. For some people dealing with things like Lyme disease um, or other kinds or lupus or other kinds of like uh, autoimmune conditions, individually they may find um, less joint symptoms from reducing those, but not everyone. So I've worked with people where they find it helpful. I've worked with other people where they cut those out and they don't find it helpful at all. So in terms of cancer specifically, they are not inflammatory foods or related to cancer risk at all. If anything, they're cancer protective and promoting of survivorship. Um, so when you see things like on Instagram or online, like it took me like five minutes, I feel like to answer your question because it's really detailed and specific. And when you're seeing like a sound bite, it doesn't get detailed or there are a lot of people who are really well-intentioned and just don't have the training and background to be able to kind of qualify those sorts of statements, right? So it's just more like, this is bad. And then it starts to kind of make it really confusing. And that happens with nutrition a lot. Um, yeah, pistachios are great for calcium. Um, they're very anti-inflammatory in terms of the type of healthy fats they offer. They have fiber and protein, legumes, same thing. Um, they're definitely not inflammatory. Now, if you are somebody who has, like I said, like really bad gas and bloating, you might find that legumes might exacerbate that. But there was like a whole thing going around with some of the, um, you know, functional medicine world. I'm not against it. I love functional medicine, but like about um, kind of across the board saying that like all beans promote inflammation. And that's simply not true. Like we see in research and we see um, if anyone follows like the blue zones, kind of how following and eating these type of foods is really beneficial in terms of health and wellness and disease. An individual, you know, you may find pinto beans give you gas or lentils give you gas. And so then, you know, there's other options, um, but it's really hard in nutrition to have like a one size fits all. And that's why it's so important to like come to these workshops, ask these questions and try to understand like, here's the information, but like, does it apply to me and how? I guess is kind of like that, that second piece of it. Um, but yeah, I think those are great questions. I mean, that would be like somebody looking at this who's more um, following like 100% plant-based diet. You know, they may not choose salmon or shrimp and that's okay. You know, there's other options. So there's kind of remembering also that you can infuse like the, the cooking and the lifestyle aspects of the Mediterranean diet as well. If some of these foods don't work for you personally, kind of look for the ones that do and then um, leverage like the other lifestyle aspects. So this is um, a figure and I, I put the source at the bottom from a study just to kind of show you. And I think this will sort of help demystify some of the, you know, the internet myths, right? So like, why are some of these foods helpful? So what do they have? And you can see it's like a European study because it spells fiber like that. I love that. Um, you know, how, how are these beneficial, right? So for example, like polyphenols are a type of phytochemical, just means plant-based compound. So some of these foods give us antioxidants, right? So we know that that can be beneficial for our immune system and reducing inflammation. Some of these foods like whole grains, vegetables, fruits, right? They give us fiber. So we know fiber helps in terms of that diabetes prevention, reducing insulin resistance, helping to um, kind of benefit cholesterol um, levels in terms of either like reducing how much your liver makes or preventing absorption of too much from what you're eating. But you can see, I mean, it may be hard to see now, but like, like olive oil doesn't have fiber, but olive oil has the polyphenols and the phytochemicals, right? So this kind of um, these type of foods can offer different things. Phytosterols, that's a compound like in found in certain plant foods, like certain vegetables that can also help limit our absorption of cholesterol. You can kind of see that heart health um, aspect. Uh, the polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, those are healthy fats. 
um, those can really help to reduce inflammation. So these are some of the mechanisms as to why um, some of these foods can be beneficial. The next graph I wanna show you from um, a different study is really thinking about the Mediterranean diet in this whole lifestyle. Meaning that if you think about somebody's lifetime, not like what happened on vacation or over the last few months, all of these different factors come into play and there's some nutrition aspects that can touch each one and then other things too. So diet, as you can see here, is only one of these circles, right? I guess technically you could think of alcohol use as part of a diet, but it's not really part of what you're eating. So these are all different things that can influence uh, risk or um, kind of how you think about your optimal health and wellness. So there's diet, but there's other things. Oxidative stress, meaning like um, environmental kind of exposures are part of that. Your gut microbiome, your mental well-being, or psychosocial factors, you know, alcohol use, metabolism, hormones, inflammation, physical activity, body composition. So we're all complex beings. And it's really important to look at this full picture and not just focus on one area. So while, you know, I'm a big fan of healthy diets, you really want to kind of be holistic when you're thinking about this. So while it's important to eat healthfully, it's also important to get some physical activity, right? It's important to get a good amount of sleep to benefit your hormones and your stress levels and your metabolism. So when we think about the Mediterranean diet, it's really helping us address this whole lifestyle. People walk a lot of places, you know, in their everyday life in the Mediterranean region. Um, people are like uh, kind of focusing on eating together as a family and that might benefit psychosocial factors. So we want to kind of look at the whole picture. Now I put this up here, that's definitely not a joke at all, but like, you know, the food pyramid is like one of the worst things that ever came out in American culture and certainly didn't help our health and wellness. Um, so this is from the Foundation for Mediterranean Diets. Um, and you can see like it's kind of international, but this is showing sort of like their version of what this pyramid should look like, right? And so, so like I hesitated to even put it up, but I, I found it really interesting because the bottom of the pyramid, so the thing that you're supposed to do the most of is not really specifically food. It's regular physical activity, adequate rest, um, convivality, which I think means like social interactions like with others, um, biodiversity and seasonality of food. So that is actually something that's relevant to all of us here, right? You've heard about the benefits of like local eating, local foods, seasonal foods. The nutrient levels are higher when something is in season because the things that reduce nutrients would be, you know, kind of time exposures to things like heat, light and oxygen. Also, there's research showing that eating local foods that are in season has an even greater benefit on your microbiome or your gut health, which then translates into immunity, longevity, mental well-being, you know, um, all those things, inflammation. So, you know, they they really do stress the import. Oh, mushrooms! I should have had that on my list. <laughs> they they really do stress the importance of local eating, um, eco-friendly kind of products. Um, and cul culinary activities, right? So again, engaging as a group, um, doing cooking classes, cooking with others, whether it's in person or virtually, um, might be with your family or with kids, or you know, you might be like uh, doing it over Zoom with friends. So really, looking at the foundation of their pyramid isn't even food yet. We haven't gotten there. Next is water. Hydration is such a key part of um, everything. We talk about inflammation and like aches and pains and joints. You know, hydration is so crucial to helping to um, make those better. And then herbal infusions, uh, not like supplements, meaning like um, ginger tea or, um, you know, other kinds of like uh, uh, natural herbs that are going to go into foods or go into like a beverage. Then we get to like the food part. So really focusing on fruits, 
one to two a day, vegetables, way more than two, like really more like, you know, three to five or more, a variety of colors, a variety of texture, a combination of cooked and raw, because they both off offer benefits. So raw spinach, you're going to get more vitamin C, but cooked spinach, you're going to get a lot more iron and a lot more vitamin K. So they're both good for different reasons. You also have in this uh, larger section, you have olive oil, you have those um, whole grain, you know, breads and rice, couscous or quinoas, you know, any of these other whole grains. Um, above that are more herbs and spices, things like garlic and onion. So, you know, some salt, but not as much. And again, a variety of flavors. There are different kinds of onions. Um, there are a lot of uh, different ways of using things like uh, garlic and onions um, for flavor. And then, you know, getting into more of those herbs and spices, olives, nuts, and seeds. So then dairy is on here, but, you know, maybe it's saying like, you know, two, it doesn't mean you have to eat this twice a day, but like, if you choose dairy, you would choose like a lower fat dairy, and it's a smaller component of the diet. So less than the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains. Then you have like proteins, like um, white meat foods, like chicken or fish and seafood, eggs and legumes. Further up are things like red meats, processed meats, more limited, sweets being at the top, not because they're the best. I mean, they, you know, but more because, uh, you know, you want to have them in a much more limited quantity. And then wine, you know, really in moderation, but not necessarily, you know, everyone is going to include that. So this is a different way of kind of looking at that holistic idea of creating that Mediterranean lifestyle. Okay, so now I want to get into some more like meal ideas. So again, feel free to kind of drop, you know, questions um, or thoughts into that Q&A. So these are some broad ideas and a couple pictures, but I'd love to hear from you knowing some of these different foods. Um, and I'll share some recipes in a moment, but what are some kinds of meals if you had to think about it? I'm realizing now I'm looking at this, there's not really a breakfast on here. So what might be a breakfast that you might think falls into the Mediterranean meal idea? And how many, um, does anybody enjoy having these? Are these things you typically cook at home? So like grain bowls can be, um, you know, variable. You can have things like hummus or tahini could be in there. You could do like kind of like a, a baked, like a falafel or kind of a chickpea or veggie burger. Um, so grain bowls can be really uh, versatile and they don't have to be heavy in grains. If you're trying to balance that, you could do some, you know, obviously like adjust the amount, um, kind of simple meals, like a protein with a whole grain and some veggies, uh, pastas, you could do regular pasta, you could do homemade pasta, um, but there are other options like chickpea pasta, lentil pasta that have a lot more fiber and protein. Yeah, eggs and spinach for breakfast is, is a great idea. And to kind of give it a little bit more lasting energy um, that you could, you know, certainly mix that with like a slice of whole grain toast. Um, there are a lot of different options. You know, there's like the Ezekiel bread or something that um, is really high in, in fiber and is like a whole grain. Um, or, you know, having, um, that's where like the polenta or the grits could come in as well. So some polenta with um, eggs and spinach uh, is a great breakfast. Um, so that, that's a great idea. And, you know, truthfully, any of these could be, you know, kind of a meal, you know, any time of day, really. Um, ooh, I'm just looking at some of the other thing, basil and tomatoes with cheese. Yes, right? Like a caprice, uh, caprese. Um, that's a great kind of, you know, not necessarily breakfast, but that, that's a great idea. Um, excellent. So, you know, as far as these meals go, these can be simple. No, sorry, go right ahead. Me? Yeah. Oh, what about um overnight oats for breakfast? Oh yeah, that's a great idea. We what are about some that things last time. that you like to put it? Or have you tried that? Like, what are some things that you like to put in? Well, I did it after we talked our last webinar, and I did the chia seeds. I did nuts, um, and then just a bunch of fruit, and then I topped it with granola. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I would think like you know next time try like something of like the herbs and spices. Like, 
maybe cinnamon or like, you know, something very fall, like nutmeg mm -hmm. or pumpkin spice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that sounds good. The, yeah, but that's a great, I love that idea, the overnight oats. That's such a good, um, easy breakfast to have. Um, I know I find that like smoothies, it's already getting kind of too chilly in the morning, um, you know, for a smoothie. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and so like with each of these, think about the kind of that herb component because I do feel like that's less typical. And when people talk about, um, you know, more, you know, vegetarian-based meals or plant-based diets being bland. I mean, how many times have people said like, oh, I would eat healthier, but it's so boring, it's so bland. So we wanna kind of get into using, using those fresh herbs um, to help season. I mean, sage is another one. I feel like that's such a, a common part of uh, Mediterranean food, but it's very like fall American, like Thanksgiving, right? So like, like mushrooms are, are really another key nutrient or uh, food that's a big part of uh, Mediterranean meals. And mushrooms have a lot of immune supportive um, properties, but they go so well with things like sage would, would go really well with that. Um, and pastas as well. I think others would be um, a lot of our fall vegetables, right? So things like um, butternut squash, pumpkin um, is a really, really high anti-inflammatory food. Those orange, vibrant, um, all the different winter squashes are all an excellent part. Um, ooh, okay, sorry, I just saw Heather's comment. I just learned about basil seeds similar to chia seeds, but they've double the fiber of potassium um, and lectin free, they don't have any flavor. You have them overnight notes or don't basil seed pudding. Ooh, that's cool. Um, yeah, there's also, I just made a recipe last night that called for um, celery seeds, which is interesting. Fennel seeds are really good. So like all of these seeds um, are delicious and, um, you know, really, really great to add in. So I think the variety is key, like kind of understanding what sits best with your body, um, what you like, what's available. But I, that's an awesome uh, suggestion, Heather. I love that. Yeah. Basil seeds are very healthy. Also like sprouted you know, getting like broccoli sprouts or other kind of sprouted um, vegetables can also be another way to boost up some of the nutrients too. Stacey, would you yeah. think Mediterranean is high in protein? I always feel like, pro you know, we always hear about protein, protein, protein. What's your take on protein? I mean, so we need protein. Like if we go back to like this pyramid, like it is on there, but like volume wise, we don't need as much like volume of protein that we do for the plant foods, but we absolutely need protein. Now during cancer treatment, a person's protein needs are higher than when they're not in treatment or after surgery. So like you need about 25% more protein when you're going through treatment than you do when you're not going through treatment. So okay. it is, you know, and then that can get kind of tricky, right? Like that's when like, if your appetite's not mm -hmm. great, then you're like adding like, you know, pea protein powders or other things mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but it's more the volume of what you're eating. You're also going to, if you don't have any protein, you won't feel full either, mm -hmm. right? Um, and protein will help balance our blood sugar um, and keep our energy up. But it's just, you know, when you look at your plate, you want like half your plate to be like vegetables and like a quarter protein and like a quarter whole grain, right? Okay. You don't need half your plate to be the protein component, if that makes sense. But you definitely okay. want to be there. And it could be beans, it could be eggs, but it certainly could be like, you know, chicken or fish would be really, um, really great too. Yeah, and so someone's, oh, someone's asking if potatoes are part of the diet. Yeah, so no, that's a good question. So um, potatoes are not as prevalent in the like Mediterranean region as they are in other areas. So right, like if your family, you know, my husband's family, our last name's Kennedy. So obviously potatoes are like a really important part of a 
traditional like Irish diet or um, other countries like Eastern European countries. So you're gonna see uh, Mediterranean is like further south. So you're gonna see different kinds of like carbohydrate foods. Um, so it's not that they're not part of it, but you would kind of loop them in more with the, maybe not quite as often um, as you would eat like a whole grain or uh, you know mushrooms or cucumbers or other other kinds of vegetables. Um, but again, like you know during treatment, if somebody's feeling nauseous, potatoes are really helpful. Potatoes are high in potassium, so you kind of have to, you know, you don't have to take it necessarily like totally literally you sort of want to adapt it to you but you know technically speaking um so Polly that's a good question okay so like I mean yes if you are taking any kind of treatment it is technically a treatment but no I'm talking uh more like chemotherapy or um specifically more like radiation chemotherapy after surgery for things like aromatase inhibitors, um, there are like things that you'd want to focus on, like exercise, hydration, uh, lots of plant-based foods, and you still need some protein, but you don't have that accelerated need. Um, it's more of the like muscle wasting effects of some kinds of cancer treatment, like um, aggressive chemotherapy, that is why that protein is um, a higher need. Or if you thought of somebody um, maybe going through like a lung cancer chemotherapy regimen and radiation, um, those treatments that tend to break down your muscle mass are kind of where you see the higher protein need, if that makes sense. But I will say for like hormonal balance and weight management, um, so for somebody taking like an aromatase inhibitor, you definitely still need protein and want to have it distributed with all your meals and snacks to, you know, balance insulin levels, keep your metabolism going. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that, that kind of, those are actually like a really good question. Um, mm. Thank you for asking that. Um, so these are just some examples of recipes I found, and we'll be posting a lot of these online in the coming future. And again, don't take this, like if you wanna have a corn tortilla, that's fine. But this, this was just kind of an example of like how to incorporate more Mediterranean things. So cumin is a really delicious Mediterranean spice. Beets are definitely a great vegetable to include. There's olive oil, tahini is like a sesame seed, you know, almost like a peanut butter, but it's sesame seeds, you know, garlic, chickpeas. So this would be kind of an example where you've got like nine grams of protein, are nine grams of fiber, about nine grams of protein. So not super high. So a person, you know, you might have this like with, you might add salmon to it or chicken if you wanted, um, but a way of really boosting up that fiber intake. Um, other ones, like I thought this isn't showing right on the screen, I'm sorry, but um, other ones are, you know, kind of we talked about that grain bowl. So things that you might want to include. And again, there's a good amount of healthy fat. There's a good amount of fiber. There's a good amount of protein. Um, there's not a ton of calories. Like for a meal, this is actually kind of on the like the lower end. Um, but plenty of fruits, uh, plenty of vegetables here, and no added sugars. So this would be an example where you'd have like you know quinoa and a bunch of different vegetables, um, some olive oil, and again, you can kind of customize this. I don't know if anybody like makes things like this or orders things like this at restaurants. Here's another one. Again, this is just a recipe. I pulled this as gluten-free pasta. You can use any pasta that you want. Um, you could definitely use like a chickpea pasta or like a lentil pasta. And that would bump the protein and the fiber up even more. But I feel like pasta gets such a bad reputation in terms of being healthy that I wanted to show an example where by adding a homemade tomato sauce, which is really simple, and by adding a lot of vegetables, you can convert something that is, you know, thought of as being unhealthy into something that really offers you a lot of nutrients. Um, so 
this one is kind of a nightshade heaven here. So, but this one's got the eggplant. It has parsley, some Parmesan cheese, the red pepper, zucchini. And again, there's the olive oil. And the sauce is so easy. So you can buy, um, you know, crushed tomatoes. You can get imported ones like Pommy. There are a lot of really good brands. If you have tomatoes from a farmer's market, it's really easy to kind of cook them down. Um, you can find canned tomatoes that are uh, BPA free or that come um, in a glass jar and make your own sauce. It does not take all day. Like if you add, you know, garlic, basil, um, a little pepper, some oregano and tomatoes, you have a sauce. It's really simple and it's delicious. And there's no added sugar. Almost every jarred sauce you're going to buy is going to have sugar added into it. And then here's like another example of, um, you know, again, it's more of a salmon meal that's kind of fresh and has some, you know, vegetables in the salad. There's a little bit of like a vinaigrette, again, just olive oil and some vinegar, but this one uses tarragon and pesto. So again, you're in the um, olives, green onions. So you're using the herbs and um, seasonings to flavor your meal so that you don't need to add a lot of sodium. You don't need to add sugar. Um, it's really easy to create something that is like visual and uh, vibrant and tasty. And then the last one I'll show you here again is like a wrap where you're using um, kind of a whole grain wrap and you're adding in different vegetables. It has a little bit of feta cheese, so it's gonna give you that flavor, give you some calcium, um, some hummus. So these are just simple things that you can make. And if you have time, like on a weekend, you could take you know, eggplant or peppers and just roast a lot of them in the oven, and then they'll be good in the fridge for a couple days. But the fiber content is a really strong reason one of the many reasons why the Mediterranean diet is healthy as we saw in that list. So again, this meal has 11 grams of fiber. Does anyone know how much fiber the average American eats on it, like in a day? Anyone wanna guess? So the recommendation is like 25 to 35 grams a day. And a lot of, um, for weight management, it's probably more like 35 to 40 plus. But on average, Americans only really eat 15 grams of fiber a day. So about half of what we need. And so something like this, that's simple, can give you, you know, almost that number. So these are some of the references. So some of the studies I mentioned and some of the figures and other things, um, the references are like hyperlinked in here. These are some resources. I should add the blue zones to this too. Um, they don't just look at Mediterranean, but I don't know if anyone's familiar with Old Ways. Uh, they've been around for a while. They're like a nonprofit um, that kind of focuses on, you know, promoting Mediterranean diets. And um, it's very kind of evidence-based. There are a lot of um, colleagues that work for Harvard School of Public Health that are, are part of the Old Ways community. Um, Harvard School of Public Health does a ton of research on Mediterranean diets. And then this other website, um, it's really great for recipes. So it's a woman of Mediterranean descent. There's not really any, there is no health information on there, which is why I liked it. Um, and it's just a ton of recipes. So another place to go for some ideas. Um, but that's really what I wanted to share as far as Mediterranean diets and health. So I'd love to uh, take any other questions or any other um, you know, topics that anyone would like to discuss. That was great. Thank you. It makes me want to go get some salmon. I'm hungry now. <laughs> any questions? We have about five minutes. Oh, oh thank you, Stacy. says Andrea. I know, and the things like the grain bowls sometimes seem kind of like daunting. But if you can kind of get organized, um, mm -hmm. they really can get simple. And, you know, you can use, I think we talked about this last time, like the boil in the bag brown rice is fine. Or like making, you know, buying the frozen pre-cooked 
you know, whole grain like quinoa or brown rice or kind of, you know, cooking a bigger batch and saving it. Um, and then just having your components. So if you're going to make salmon for dinner, make extra so you can kind of put a salad or a bowl together, um, you know, sort of having extra vegetables, you know, if, you know, buying like the carrots and like peeling a bunch of them, maybe chopping them, putting them in a container in the fridge, like just kind of getting yourself organized mm -hmm. in terms of the meal prep really does make it easy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you can make hummus, but you can certainly buy hummus. You can buy pesto. There are a lot of brands that are, have very simple ingredients. Um, you know, so I think it's the organization part that can make it easier to kind of eat a Mediterranean diet. Um, okay. So yeah, so that's a good question about nuts. Yeah. So generally speaking about a quarter cup is a serving of nuts. Um, so if you're having it as a snack, like a quarter cup of nuts with like a piece of fruit, you know, like a clementine, that would be a great snack. If you're adding some nuts, say into a salad or into a grain bowl, you might not even need that many because you have other um, healthy fats already in there, like avocado, um, olives or olive oil. So over like a salad or a grain bowl, you might do like half of that, like an eighth of a cup or a cup, you know, a tablespoon or two. Um, and I like to chop them up to put them like into a salad or a grain mm -hmm. bowl because it adds that nice texture. So I might take the walnuts and, you know, chop them a little bit or the pistachios or whatever. Um, but that would, that would pretty much be like a serving. And, but you could have that like once or twice a day, you know, depending, um, but they really add a nice texture too. And so that's kind of part of that whole uh, Mediterranean like eating experience. Nice. All right. I think that's it. Um, all right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. So the next uh, session is November 8th, I believe. And it's all about how to live um, a lifestyle with low sugar. So that's going to be a good one. I think a lot of people are going to come to that one. Um, oh, we have a couple more. Um, oh, people are just saying thank you. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming. Um, I hope that we see all of you guys next time. And let me know if you guys have any questions, always um, email me and I'll be sending out this um, these slides to you guys as well. So thanks for coming. Thank you so much, everyone. It was great to see